Hello, I'm Lucas, and today we will be making DevOps people cry. Welcome to Hands on Bison. Today we'll be talking about infrastructure in Scala. Quick slide about me. I'm your new Scala developer advocate at Virtus Lab. If you have any issues, problems, or you know you just want to complain about Scala, feel free to reach me, whatever channel you want. I'm on all Discords. I'm also available at uh, Twitter, or however you call it today. Um, and you can also reach me at my email, at, it's, it's uh, lbiali at virtuslab.com. I mostly do Scala. Um, I double in functional programming and distributed systems. And let's quickly go, oh, yeah, obviously. Um, I have no idea what's going to happen today because it's live coding session. So that's a reminder, and let's go quickly through the agenda. So um, first I want to explain very briefly what Pulumi is, how one uses it, and why you actually should care about it. Then we are going to proceed with you know, making DevOps people cry, deploying something live and seeing what happens. That's you know, always a happy experiment. There are always happy accidents at that. So I'm obviously very sorry about what can and might happen. And there's also the reminder for myself that the marketing people asked me to take a selfie. So everybody say please, fromage, Cool. Yeah, with that out of the way, let's talk about Pulumi. So here's a quick quote from uh, Joe Duffy, the CEO of Pulumi. In, you know, you can read, so I'm, I'll just explain that very briefly. Pulumi is like Terraform, but you can use a programming language, like a true programming language, to actually describe all the infrastructure that you want to have in your environment. The difference is, if, if you compare that with like CDK, for instance, uh, the difference is that you are able to work in an interactive way because Pulumi programs aren't just describing stuff. They allow you to do interactive operations on the stuff as it's happening. That allows a lot of very nice capabilities that you wouldn't have with any other tools in this space. Okay, so I mentioned there are multiple languages and Pulumi supports TypeScript, Python, Java, uh, Golang and the whole .NET ecosystem out of the box. The, those are the mainline SDKs offered by Pulumi. And there's also Virtuslab, who offers two additional SDKs, one for Scala and one for Kotlin. Okay, so how does a you know, Pulumi program look like? In this case, that's a Bison program, so Scala SDK. So you have a main method that's Scala free only, so we can use all the nice new features in Scala free. We have a Pulumi run function, and inside of the body of this function, uh, we have the implicit context. We are using context function here, so you don't even have to mention that there's an implicit argument here. Um, and we, you know, basically, this, this program is going to deploy Apache HTTP, HTTPD server uh, to an EC2 instance in AWS. So we just pull an AMI image, we fetch the, can you see, yeah, can you see my cursor? Okay, so we fetch the image that we are interested in, uh, we provide some of the input, some information that we need uh, to, to fetch the correct uh, image, like that we, uh, we are interested in the most recent one, for instance. And in the end, we, <coughs> we just say that we are interested in the ID property of this image. Then, uh, we obviously we are working on AWS, so security groups are a big thing. We have to define a security group, so we define ingress uh, for TCP on ports 22 and 80, so SSH and HTTP. And then we define the size of the instance that we want to use. We define a small cloud init script uh, here in Bash, sorry for that. And then uh, we create an EC2 instance with you know all the arguments and data that we have defined before. So we pass the security group here, we pass the image here, and then the cloud init script at the end. And then at the end of the program, we just tell that we want to export two properties out of this program. So a public IP of the instance that we have created and the host name. And that's the end of the program. So if you are like, wait, what? I'll, I'll go quickly through the anatomy of a Pulumi program. So Pulumi operates on stacks. Um, a stack is 
an instance of a blueprint that your program creates. You can modify your program, and Pulumi will then, when you're applying your program, make uh, a diff between what it knows exists in the cloud and uh, what your program declares as new set of resources. So we have a, a blueprint and then an instance of this blueprint, just like with objects. Then we have resources and inputs. So this here is a constructor of AWS S3 bucket, which takes uh, just an ACL as an input. You can put a dynamic value in an output here, but you can also put a direct value like a string, like a literal string here. Um, interesting bit here is that uh, we return, so the engine returns all the resources wrapped in outputs. So what are outputs? Outputs are actually properties that are dynamic in context of your program. They might be dynamic in the context of uh, you doing some transformations on them, but they can also be dynamic in the context of uh, being values fetched during the deployment from your actual target environment. So in this case, this export uh, is just the value of actual URL that AWS would set up for your bucket if you published it as a you know, public bucket holding some static HTML files. OK, so here's a small example just to reiterate and, and see what that means in, in the context of the full program. Um, we have two S3 buckets, one for pictures of cats, obviously, and one for pictures of dogs. And then we return a stack instance at the end, because we're functional programmers. We want to return stuff from our functions. So in this case, we just return two URLs. And why would that matter? Why would we return stuff from our stacks? So Pulumi is actually composable. It means that you can build small blocks and then build from those small blocks bigger blocks. Uh, the largest, the more, you know, the most um, top level instance of composability for Pulumi are stacks. So you can build stuff in stacks, deploy them, and then you can depend in other stacks on values that were exported by those other stacks. So a quick example would be that you define infrastructure for a Kubernetes cluster in one stack, then in another stack, depend on values that come from this previous stack regarding infrastructure, deploy Kubernetes on top of those values, and export some values that are necessary to use Kubernetes. And then in the third level stack, you depend on the Kubernetes stack and use kubeconfig, basically. Um, Plumi also allows users to define their own components inside of their programs in their favorite language. And that is meant to help users aggregate resources uh, that they are, they are used together, like EKS, for instance. It's a component package. And what is a component package? So Pulumi has a mechanism that allows you to um, publish components defined in your programming language to be usable for um, users of other languages. So it is possible, currently in theory, because we are working on it, it is possible to define components in Scala republish them as component packages and let people using Python or uh, Golang to use them. There is also, there is also automation API. That's, that's the feature that we are really most interested in about, about because automation API allows uh, Pulumi users to embed their Pulumi programs inside of other programs. Like, for instance, you can embed uh, BSOM inside of your test kit and then um, you know, create whole environments in tests. You can do something completely different. You can um, embed Pulumi program inside of a Scala application and then use it as a controller on uh, Kubernetes to operator, sorry, on the Kubernetes level and then create whole new namespaces on the fly when you need them. You can go even further. You can build an HTTP application that would have control over your cloud environments and build whole tenant environments when you need them. There's also something called Pulumi CrossGuard, and that's a feature that we currently don't support, but we plan to. And uh, that's a feature that allows you to enforce policies on all 
resources that Pulumi is aware of. So if Pulumi manages a huge set of resources for your uh, big enterprise company, and you are tasked with, okay, could you check that every single resource has a you know, good tag, the valid tag for this resource? You can do it very easily because Pulumi basically allows you to iterate over all the resources and apply policies to them. Okay, so um, I hope you are ready for this because we are going to go into actual live coding session. And okay, that's a bit too far. Okay, so what we are going to do? Um, we are going to deploy a very small. Obviously, it has to be a startup AI application because we are um, we have to you know go with the with the fashion. So uh, we have to have all the um, all the all the what's the correct word? Buzzword bingo. Yeah, we have to win the buzzword bingo. So we are obviously going to use Loom because it's 24 already. So we have um, Tapir using Loom here. Uh, we have HTMX here because obviously why why wouldn't we? So HTMX is here, and um, it's uh, just using OpenAI because why not? So we use STP OpenAI extension uh, to ask uh, questions. To GPT. Okay, so that's the app. It's just a basic uh, HTTP app, but we want it to, you know, run on cloud because we have to spend the VC money, right? So, uh, what we are going to do in terms of architecture of our solution? So, we are uh, we are a startup, so we don't want to spend too much. Going to a big public cloud provider would be too costly. So we are going to use Hetzner, which is a smaller cloud provider. It's a German provider, and it offers uh, VPSs with you know very nice prices. But they don't have really um, managed stuff. But you know we are in a startup. We want to do complex stuff. We want to you know obviously use a Kubernetes instance because why not? Why wouldn't we? But we are not going to actually use a full Kubernetes instance. We are going to use K3s, which is a smaller um, more reasonable variant of Kubernetes made, made by rancher people. And it gives up on some of the properties, but allows you to uh, have a reasonable subset of properties. For instance, it is not a highly available um, setup by default. You can do this, but by default you don't. It's a, a leader follower setup, so we'll have a leader server and two followers. Um, and we are going to use Cloudflare because we want to make our application available via DNS, via a domain name. Okay, so let's go to the actual code. Now, I did this talk a few times before, and uh, actual live coding takes much too long, so we are going to cheat about a, a little. Here's our program, and right now it doesn't do really anything, we can just run it. Now the interesting bit about Pulumi is that it has the same capability as Terraform. So what it did, it uh, started with a preview, checked what would change in comparison to the previous state, and then asks us, okay, do you want to apply this? Well, it's a, you know empty stack, so yeah, let's apply it. Okay. And there hasn't really nothing that happened because you know we didn't do anything. We have just an empty stack. Okay, so first of all, uh, we want to have those Hetzner servers, but you know, um, being distributed is very important. Uh, so we are going to create them in three different zones. I think that's Feisenberg, Nuremberg, uh, Feisenstein. I'm I'm not sure. Nuremberg and Helsinki. Um, then. To be able to talk with those servers, uh, we absolutely need to provide SSH keys because, well, we, we wouldn't want to connect to servers using passwords. So we are going to inform um, BSOM that we have both um, public and private keys that we want to use, and then we are going to create a server pool. So this is 
you know, just the usual Scala code. We uh, use a range to create three servers. Uh, we then interpolate the numbers into the names of that. Uh, interesting bit here is that, sorry for the, okay, metals is chills, okay. Um, so interesting bit is that there are two names actually. One is the name, and that's the thing I'm currently on. That is the name of the resource that Pulumi will use to reference this resource. This is the name of the resource in Pulumi. Now, in the arcs section, those are the arguments that will be passed to the cloud provider. So we have a name here, and it's the same string, basically. Um, but this name will be used by the cloud to identify this resource. So the rest are mostly irrelevant details, the type of the server uh, that we want to use Ubuntu uh, for the operating system. We use Modulo to distribute uh, servers uh, on the locations that we have defined before. We pass the SSH keys and we want to use IPv4 only. We don't want IPv6. Okay, now how do we run this? Um, let me drop this, we don't need this anymore. But we have to return a stack, right? So, um, when we want to pass something that uh, we want to just use, we don't want to export that yet. Or maybe let's, let's go with an export, it will be even you know, more helpful. Okay, so output is a monad, um, and it's also a wrapper around IO, Zio, and future. So that means that we have the same, same kind of operations that you would usually expect. I don't think Copilot is helping here, really. Maybe it is. Oh, he might be right, actually. It will be probably easier on this point. Will it? Oh, yeah. Sounds about right. So we have an output of vector of string, which is what we would expect. We want to have a vector of IPs wrapped in an output because we are operating on those values that come from the engine. And we export those IPs. And let's try and apply it. Oh. Yeah, okay, that's a lint telling me that I, I didn't use this. Okay, that looks fine. So we are going to create three servers and an SSH key. Now the funny bit is, <coughs> when we move further, those operations would be actually uh, done in parallel. But for this simple example, I've used sequence, and sequence isn't doing stuff in parallel, it's just going one by one. So we're, we're you know, forced to wait a bit. Um, full example actually does all this stuff in parallel. Okay. That is probably not what we wanted. Yeah, it's a name. <laughs> I messed up. Uh, we want IP be four address. Okay, let's see what happens. I'm actually not sure what will happen. That's a new mistake I made on the scene. Oh, cool. It figured out that there's a diff and just replies the names with IPs. That's, that's great. Okay, so we have three servers, and if we do, they should be, yeah, they are here. Falkenstein, it's Falkenstein actually. Helsinki and Nuremberg, we have three servers, that's fine. Um, and we have a Scala program that manages them and talks with them via SSH. Okay, so the next bit is, because we are a startup, we are going to deploy K3S. So let's comment this bit out. We will need to introduce stack export later on, but for now let's just work on the cluster. So this bit is a, a bit involved. Um, let me go quickly through this and explain what we are actually trying to do here. So K3S, um, as all Kubernetes instances, will need um, a set of credentials to pull 
um, Docker images from a repository of our choice. I'm using GitHub Container Registry, so that means that I have to provide a configuration file for K3S. It's massively easier with K3S, to be honest, with, you know, in comparison to any other distribution. It's just a YAML file that we have to place in a correct place on the file system and then restart the main daemon of K3S, and it will just gobble up the secrets and, and set them up for me. So we take the secret, and that's a new concept here. Pulumi has a concept of management of secrets. Um, I can show all those secrets to you, and it doesn't matter really, because they are encrypted. They're encrypted with the password that I'm using to protect my stack. Uh, so they are placed here. We can see them. Uh, config uh, get, I think it was. No. Oh. Oh, it's just config. Okay, so you can see what configuration is set up. I did set this up um, before because I didn't want to share all my, you know, cloud credentials with you. Um, but, oh, they, they deployed a new version. <laughs> um, so what we do here is that we fetch a string configuration with this name, and we have it here as an output. It's an output of string. Then we can uh, use Pulumi interpolator here, which allows us to put outputs, which are asynchronous values. Think futures when you think about outputs. We can put this in an interpolation, and it won't be uh, what you would expect, you know, a stringified future. It will actually return an output of a string. And uh, if we had solved this small particular problem with uh, Scala CLI setup internally, I would be able to use our compiler plugin that would actually crash if I tried to interpolate an output inside of a normal string inside of S interpolation or row interpolation. Sadly, there's a bug, so sorry for that. Anyway, um, what we want to do is we want to put this uh, nice YAML file inside of this etc rancher k3s registers YAML uh, file. So we just create a very small snippet of bash that would do this. Then we define the result, the class that will represent all the stuff that we have created in creating the K3S cluster, something that we want to pass around later in our program just as a reference to the created resource, the whole bunch of resources. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, go with the, draw the whole fucking owl, and I'm just going to uncomment a lot of code to make it compile. Okay. And let's quickly go through that. So we have the server pool that we defined before. We sequence that to get a vector, oh, come on, vector of servers. And then we split them, because as I mentioned before, K3S uh, in the default setup demands that we will have a leader and then we will have followers. So we do an unsafe operation here, but we don't care. It's a startup, you know, money is on, on our mind. So we're just taking the head, the first server, and then we use the rest for the follower setup. Then we define a connection. So we have some parameters that we have to define. And it's basically that we want to use the IPv4 address of the leader and the private SSH key which we, which we need to connect to this to the server. And then we use the remote uh, module of the command package from Bison that allows us to um, treat remote commands, something that you would usually do with something like Ansible or, or Salt, for instance, treat them as resources. So they have all the properties that you would have with any other Pulumi resource. Any resource in Pulumi is, a, is an instance of something like a CRUD. So um, all the resources have create operations, delete operations, update operations, and obviously they can be read. In this case, we just uh, use the create and delete to pass some you know, small snippets of uh, bash. So uh, we are going to completely, we are a startup, remember, uh, we are completely going to disregard any security. We are just going to install K3S by an unsafe bash script fetched from the internet. But we you know, are thinking about security because we are going to use WireGuard to encrypt whole traffic that's going to happen in the cluster. So. Um, having, having thought about security, um, we then just defined that should we want to delete the cluster, just use the provided uninstall script from the K3S, and then we go, all, uh, we go, on, we go on and then we uh, 
define some additional operations that we need to actually use the stuff that we have defined. So we need a leader token that's something that is created on leader nodes uh, and you need to pass it to all the follower nodes to be able to safely connect to the cluster. So we just, you know, it's a file on the file system. We can just use a command, cut the file, and the output, the standard out of the command, will be content of this file. So we, we are just reaching to the server, getting the file, using the connection to the leader, and just cutting the file, we get it as a standard out. We do a similar thing with the uh, echo file command before. So we just put content this time. So it's the, it's, it's the YAML configuration that we defined here. We put it here, um, and we set up uh, this one. This bit is a, a bit important. So Plumi is actually parallel by default, because if it, if it wasn't, it would be painfully slow. Those APIs of all the cloud providers are kind of slow. So what you want to do is you want to go as fast as possible. You want to go parallel by default. And that's a bit of a problem, because if you do this, and we also do this, so FlatMap in, um, in, in, in BSUM isn't necessarily meaning what you expect. It doesn't necessarily mean that the resource is already done when you get flat mapped. Because resources are just case classes that have outputs. Outputs can be resolved later on. You get just a reference to a set of properties that might be resolved later on if they don't crash. So we have to have a way to um, pass this um, dependency chain uh, in another way. And uh, SDKs in Pulumi do this by resource options. Uh, which we have here. So we define an opts and we pass a depends on and we just tell on which resources we want to wait. We have to do this because parallelism is not an opt-in, it's by default. And actually the sequential evaluation is something that we have to opt in. Uh, so we get the leader token, we put the configuration for GitHub container registry. We then, uh, after inserting the token, uh, we restart the leader so that it fetches the configuration for the registry. And we just, you know, you do, do the systemctl force reload for that. Then we fetch the cube config. It's just the same thing, thing as with the token. We just fetch the configuration file from the file system. We only wait until the leader initializes. And then we do basically the same thing, but for, with the followers. So the difference is actually for the followers, we need to pass the token that we have fetched from the leader, and we have to pass the leader's IP address so that all the nodes can join. Um, beside that, we, we do the same a bit with uh, GitHub container registry here to install the actual uh, credential set. Um, and we also have to restart all the followers so those credentials can be loaded. Um, in the end, we just fetch a set of IP addresses again from those servers. We deleted the previous code, so we have to do this again. And then we do something that is really interesting, because uh, when K3S generates a kubeconfig, it generates this file on the server. As you, might re as you might remember, we just fetch this file by reading it from the server's disk. So the local version of the file um, will uh, name the cluster by, by default, the name is default. And it also references um, Kubernetes API server on the local host. So it's basically using the loopback uh, interface for that. But we are in Pulumi. It's a dynamic programming environment in which you can interact with values that are evaluated during the deployment. So if we want to have a way to reach our cluster from our server, which is not the local host of the cluster, we have to do some small adjustments to the kubeconfig file. And it's actually quite easy. We just fetch it as a string here. And then we replace the default name of the cluster with our cluster name, and replace the um, loopback interface with leader IP. So the kube uh, CTL on our node is capable of reaching the cluster. Then we just uh, sequence the things that we have here um, so that we got we get a single output of the case class that we have defined before. And in the end, what we get, where this whole block stops, 
it's an output of K3S, and that's exactly what we want to get. So we define a stack, we define an export, and yeah, that's something that we probably want to get. Does it compile? Probably. Let's try and see. No, it doesn't. Not found private key. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Good catch. Okay, that's Borg 2. I probably should, you know, just use the helper. Um, okay, let's try. Cool. Okay, um, the diff is um, only mentioned because new cube config path is created. I'm not sure if we are doing the correct thing. I might have gone a bit too fast, but because what we actually want to do, we want to output that to a file. And that is not the path. It would just print the cube config to our console. So, um, let's drop this and define um, Okay, that should be fine. So we, we aren't actually very interested about that. We can just put it as a dependency of the stack. So here you can just pass anything that you want evaluated. You are doing pure functional programming. So anything that isn't used is actually that code. It doesn't do anything. So if you want to have something evaluated, you have to make the stack aware of this bit of the code. You don't have to, uh, at least for you know resources, you don't have to think about the duplicating stuff because the resources are resource constructors are deduplicated by default. Any other code, on the other hand, will be avoided multiple times, so it's worth remembering. Okay, let's try and see what we, it will do this time. And oh, okay. Let's try. So um, we have. 12 minutes, right? That's probably not very good. So things are going to get a bit more stressful now. Okay, so here we can see Plumi gladly chugging all the data that we have provided and setting things up for us. Leader is already up. Now we are setting up follower nodes. Okay, it seems that it has worked. Let's just um, use a small trick to fetch the setup. And our environment should be this one. And yeah, we have our cluster here. So everything checks out, seems to work. Let's move on and do another set of stuff. So now we are going to do something that is considered by my friend who is working with me, and he's actually a proper DevOps. I'm more like a Scala guy, but he's actual DevOps guy. And he considers this a bit insane, because you would usually want to separate layers. Like I mentioned before, you probably should deploy infrastructure, then on another stack deploy Kubernetes to this infrastructure. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leverage the fact that we are actually inside of, a same, of the same program, and we can reuse the same set of variables that we defined to you know, just go on and place another set of layers in the same program. So we are going to just pass this setup information, the kubeconfig file that we have fetched from the cluster, and fed, feed it to the Kubernetes module provider. So providers are special resources that allow to 
configure different connections to different accounts, for instance. So you might have multiple providers for AWS and uh, work on multiple accounts at the same time. In this case, we are just setting up Kubernetes provider that will, um, well, it will just use this um, cluster that we have set up dynamically uh, before. Here's the original bit about writing the kubeconfig file. We're going to preserve it and delete this one. And, okay, so we have to deploy our application, actually. Um, we are going to just start with setting up labels. That's something that if you know Kubernetes, how many of you know Kubernetes? How many of you have Kubernetes PTSD? Hands up. Not a lot, okay. Uh, well, labels are something that you use and they are something that usually gets broken. They are something that you use to actually um, point from one Kubernetes resource to another resource. So for instance, services look up pods uh, by labels. So uh, in YAML manifests in Kubernetes, when you have to type this thing into YAML, and then you set or whatever grab to find things uh, inside of them, uh, it's, it's quite common to make some small mistakes and then uh, Kubernetes is very happy to apply those manifests, but nothing works. So we can completely ditch this problem by just defining those uh, things as values inside of our program and just reuse those values. We don't have to worry about that. That's the power of programming and not YAML. So then our application obviously requires an open API token. We are going to pull it from the configuration and then we are going to create the namespace in Kubernetes because we need that to actually put stuff in it. And as you can see, we are leveraging uh, the pattern with opts to provide the provider that we want to use, the cluster to which we want to deploy. Then we have some other values that we want to use. So we create a deployment. It's a Kubernetes resource that um, manages your pods as they run um, on the Kubernetes. So we use the labels that we have defined, be be uh, that we have defined before in multiple places, actually, we pass the reference uh, to the namespace name because we want this deployment to run in the same space. Um, we then define the container. So uh, I did upload the application build before. I always do this before I start presentation because Wi-Fi is spotty sometimes and um, it's a bit of a problem if you are trying to push 200 megabytes during the presentation. So we have that already on uh, GitHub container registry. We are just going to pass some additional stuff about environment configuration and the OpenAI open, open uh, API token. We are going to expose the HTTP port of our application and we are going to set up readiness and liveness probe because that's just a good practice and we can do this, why not? At the end, uh, we inform it about the namespace. That's the usual stuff that you would have in YAML, so nothing really fancy. And we define a service because we want to expose our pods that we have how many of them? Three, three replicas. We are going to have three replicas. So we are going to be highly available. Um, and then we create a service which will serve as a load balancer. So the service type is load balancer. It just pushes, uh, pushes the values of the service ports into correct places. It reuses the same labels so we don't make a mistake. Um, like I mentioned before, we have to point towards the correct set of pots. So we just put this label set here. Um, there are some additional properties that have to be done here uh, for services to work correctly. So we have to delete a service before we replace it in terms of if we want to do any changes. There are ways to obviously do this differently by creating another resource and not you know, breaking everything for all our users that are using the service for load balancing but we're just going with the simple stuff for now. And then finally, we are going to define an ingress. So the entry point to our cluster um, that will allow our application to actually receive traffic inside of the cluster. And the ingress uh, is going to use something that is already built in into K3S and that is um, traffic. Traffic is the default load balancer in K3S. So we are just configuring it to use this host name. This host name must, is, is my private domain. Um, it's called Machine Spirit, um, and I have it configured in, 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 in Cloudflare, so it's the easiest thing for me to use. Um, then we pass all the configuration from above, yada, yada, and uh, we move on to define 
we actually could apply this. So let's try and do this. Um, what is not going to work? This is not going to work for now. Does it compile? Okay, four minutes. Okay, so um, we have the deployment done, and now the service is looking up for looking up the pods. Looks like it went okay, but let's let's check. It kind of looks okay. Um, get endpoints. Yeah, looks fine. We have three endpoints as we wanted. Okay, so um, we can check this here and not to lose any more time. We are just going to do the same bit as before. We're going to configure Cloudflare provider with the configuration that we fetch from our config. And then we are going to create a set of A records, A DNS records that we need. So we need to use um, IPs of the nodes that we have set up. And what we want to do is we just want to create plain um, DNS records that point this domain with a you know a type of the record to this ip we need three records each for every uh, machine we set up the sorry ttl uh, we set up the zone id from configuration we use the provider that we have defined before add this bit to the stack because we just want to evaluate this it's a records it's an output of vector of stuff And then we run it. Okay, seems fine. Let's see and try. Seems it works. So we have just defined the whole infrastructure that we needed to do, you know, a crazy, complex, um, obviously, startup tier infrastructure with all the um, possible mistakes, like interpreting uh, random bash scripts from the internet, but also setting things up correctly for high availability for the customers that we will never have. And it's up and running. So I just want you to, you know, let this sync in the whole thing is in scala we didn't really touch anything that isn't functional programming without you know the small bits of bash in you know some places but other than that everything is fine here are the links i invite you to take it for a ride we have just released the second release which is which is o2 version uh, it solves most of the bugs that we have encountered in the initial beta, beta phase so it's almost ready. We, are, we just don't want to commit to full stability of the API right now, but we're working on new features like automation API, uh, like you know, being fully uh, feature compliant with mainstream, um, mainstream SDKs of Pulumi. Um, everything is almost ready. I, have, I think we have 150 cloud providers published to Maven. They must love us because some of them uh, weigh over 300 max. But you know that's that's what you get if you cover the whole AWS or Azure API. And thank you. That would be all from me. Hello. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, thinking about the supply chain, if a cloud provider released a new feature. What would have to happen before we're able to use that feature in our Scala code through this new library? Okay, so the supply chain is um, part of the 
the biggest chunk of the ecosystem for Pulumi operates by wrapping Terraform providers, which, as you might know, are separate programs that yeah. just expose Terraform's gRPC interface. So Pulumi wraps that, converts the gRPC interface of Terraform to its own interface, uh, and they, you know, they manage um, those providers for smaller uh, providers, and then uh, they do the same thing as um, Terraform team did. So the biggest providers are given away to cloud providers, and I think, uh, for instance, Amazon is actually um, helping with maintenance of the AWS setup. Uh, it's an ongoing thing um, because you know they are growing, and it's a thing. It's, it, it needs some negotiations with the bigger, bigger providers. But for instance, um, I've been made aware that OVH, a French cloud provider, is maintaining the OVH package for Pulumi. Uh, now, that only means that they uh, add those features on Terraform level, then Pulumi repackages that and it publishes the provider package, which is the internal part. That's something that Engine talks with. Now, any change uh, that happens to this provider package means changes to a schema file. Now, those schema files are used to code generate packages on side of all the SDKs. So Pulumi generates packages for the languages they maintain, and we have set up in CI that the text changes in those schemas that we fetch from them. If there are changes, we also have a notification that, okay, that needs redeployment, and we can redeploy the new version. So uh, just to make this more you know, concrete, uh, yesterday, uh, the DevOps guy that works with me on, 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 on Bism uh, released the newest version for AWS and GCP. So um, it is a bit involved, but the pipeline works and uh, updates are going to be streamed as they happen in Terraform. Okay, thank you. Hello, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, let's say you have uh, an application to deploy, uh, would you recommend to um, have one application on one repo and one deployment application uh, with Pulumi uh, apart, or would you make only one repository? That's a that's a that's a good question, and actually, the answer is the answer is obviously it depends. Um, there's a m there are multiple factors that have to be taken into account. If it's like a mono repo for a set of microservices. Uh, what we actually support um, is that you can use whatever build tool you use. Uh, so you can make a sub-module in your repo just for uh, BSOM and, and then uh, use it from this repo. Um, you can also do separate uh, Git repo. There are, there are no real reasons why you wouldn't. Um, now, we are working on features that might complicate this a little bit. Not sure how they will shape up really, but what we want to get, what we actually are, you know, those, those are just building blocks. Um, so let me, let me off top a little bit by, while answering your question, because I don't really know what, what to answer to you. It's, it really depends on the setup of, of your environment, of uh, your team's capabilities. Uh, you might, for instance, want to use in a larger organization, you, want, you might want to use uh, different Pulumi stacks driven by different teams and just uh, have all the teams share uh, the same place to store state and then you can reference stacks uh, between the teams. But, and then obviously the code can't live in the same place. It's, you know, one piece is in Go, other is in TS, other is in Scala. But if you have a pure Scala team, and you want to manage, probably it would be the simplest way to just put it in the same repository and, you know, um, get version it together. But uh, on the off-top side, I think I lost the thread anyway. <laughs> ah, the features. So what we want to do, what, um, like I mentioned, BSOM is just building block for us. It's, it's the, um, the most, you know, basement part of the building. What we want to have is higher abstractions for full... Uh, turnkey solutions that you just put your application into or set of applications. You just provide credentials that you need to run it and then just deploy the whole thing. And what I think is the killer feature here is we want to integrate infrastructure layer 
with application layer. So if you define some configuration that you need in your, in your application, your deployment layer should fail to compile if you aren't providing the configuration that is necessary for the application to deploy correctly. And that's our end goal. That's a feature that I'm currently drafting. Um, that's probably going to take some time, but I hope, I hope a POC will be ready for Scholar. So, you know, with a, with a bit of an off-top, I, I, I hope I answered your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>